The theme of today is altars. Can we have the altar slide? All through scripture, you see this reoccurring theme of altars. Even if you just go out to a restaurant these days, there's an altar in every restaurant you walk into. Altars were places where man and God met. There was an understanding that the supernatural would come in a place where there was an altar built. There was an understanding that in that place there was providence. There was an understanding that in that place there was this, a space for the supernatural. Everything that God built, Satan counterfeits. The first altar was built in the garden. We see that Noah after the flood built an altar. But every altar that was built was given so that we would understand a dimension of the altar so that when the ultimate altar was raised and the ultimate lamb was sacrificed, we would understand the depth of what was happening. And so today you will hear a number of short verses shared. We will have some songs in between, songs of worship in between the words that are shared. The purpose of the words is to give us a dimension and to understand why the Old Testament altars were there, why those stories were there, what were they trying to show us so we would catch a glimpse, catch a dimension of what it is we celebrate today, what it is we remember today. So we're going to go into one more song before a word is shared and then the lights will come on, but please remain in an attitude of worship.
So first, we'll look at one of the altars that Abraham built, where faith met obedience, and he was willing to sacrifice his only son. Now, I know you all know this story. We see this story in Genesis 22, and you all are familiar, but let's open our hearts to the Lord, hearts to our Lord, and let him do what he intends to do today, yeah? Okay, so we heard Pastor Sam just share that every altar that we see in the Old Testament was a shadow of the ultimate, perfect altar where Jesus Christ was sacrificed, right? But what's amazing about Genesis 22 is that it, is the, it perfectly foreshadows Good Friday. So you're going to hear about this now. So Jesus, our ultimate sacrifice, the atonement for the sin of all of mankind, Jesus, the Son of God, was sacrificed for you and me on that cross on Good Friday. Now, let's see what the Lord wants to teach us today through this story. What, what, what does he want to show us? I know because we've heard this many, many times. But park everything and let the Lord teach you. Open your heart. So, if we go to Genesis 22, 2, God says to Abraham, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there. So Moriah means God has foreseen. So God has already seen. Now, when God commanded Abraham to take his only son, the son you love the most, what was his next step? He was obedient. He was getting ready to take his only son as God told him to. That is because he trusted this God. And this God is trustworthy. He had faith on a God that he knew who is faithful, who is trustworthy, right? So we see Abraham taking Isaac and starts the journey to fulfill what God told him to do. Now, I want, you to tell, I want to tell you, Isaac was the son of promise, right? Isaac was the most precious. If you read the study Bible, it says he's the most beloved, the precious son. Abraham's all, right? But... In obedience, in complete obedience to God, because he trusted this God, he was willing to sacrifice his son. And so Isaac takes his son and goes. Now, uh, when, when, while they are walking, Isaac asks Abraham, Now, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire, where's the lamb? Now, in Genesis 22.8, I want you to listen to Abraham's answer because it tells us the hope he has it in his heart because this God is faithful, because this God will not go back on his promise. And he, Abraham said to Isaac, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb. God will provide for himself the lamb. That's the hope Abraham held on to. He was willing to sacrifice his son knowing God will provide. Even it meant that he actually laid his son down, his everything, his most precious thing down. He trusted this God. And this God is faithful, for he will provide. That's what Abraham said, right? And he did. God provided. How amazing is this God? He provided. Isaac walked a mountain carrying the wood that he was to be the sacrifice on. But he was not. For God provided a substitute ram stuck or um, caught in a thicket by his horns. Roughly about 1,800 years later, now paint this picture, roughly about 1,800 years later, the most precious son of God, Jesus himself, walks the same mountain, carrying this wooden cross on his back. But there was no substitute this time. He was going to be the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. And this is our Father's heart. This is the heart of God who loves. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And you see in John 1, John, when John sees Jesus, he says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of this world. And Jesus was the perfect, perfect sacrifice. Now we saw the heart of the Father. I want you to see the heart of the Son. Because he loves this father so much, 
son, Jesus, he says, in obedience, Father, not my will, but let your will be done. The love that he had for the Father, the trust that he had in the Father, but there was a cost. Church, there was a cost. There is a cost when we obey. There's a cost to the sacrifice. And Jesus paid this cost with his life. His own precious life for you and I. On that wooden cross, he willingly gave up his life. So you and I can, um, so the Father can reconcile everything to him through this sacrifice. Now the other thing I want to show is because of his complete obedience, even to death, there was a blessing in obedience, there is a blessing. In obedience, there's a providence. For like how God provided, God provided again for us through Jesus. It was the perfect redemption story. So you and I can come to our Father without any barriers. Right? So this Good Friday, I really want us to bow our hearts. Take a moment to reflect in our hearts. Now, we know the old in Genesis presented Abraham's commitment to, obey, to, to, to obey what God said. Willingly, without a doubt, because this God is faithful. He is our God. He is the same God. Now, I ask you today, what is that you love the most? Abraham loved the most Isaac. But when God said to sacrifice, he was willing. What is it that in your heart that you love the most? Are you willing to give it? Are you willing to leave it at the foot of the cross? Because if you know the giver is faithful, you will hold nothing back. For he is the most precious reward you and I could ever ask for. Nothing else matters more. So this afternoon, I want to ask you, are you willing to give up the most thing that you love for him? For there is power, Redemption, victory, blessing, providence. Through faith, when you obey, everything else will be in his will. He will, will be provided. And also I want to ask you, we, we see in dying, in Jesus dying, that's where we see the perfect glory. Yeah? We are we willing to die every day, not just Good Friday, not just some days, not just a Sunday? Every day, when we want to make a choice, are we willing to say, the Lord, not my will, let your will be done? Are we willing to sacrifice daily so he can be glorified through us? Okay, sing a song. You may remain seated. You may stand as we sing. Worship him. Thank you, Jesus.
Happy Good Friday. Isn't it the best Friday of your life? It's mine. All of my freedom, every bondage that was broken, everything that was disarmed, everything, every work of the enemy, every show was made on that Calvary, on, that, on this day. And I celebrate it, and I pray it becomes the best Friday of your life too. I have an account to share with you um, of an altar that David built. Um, David was a really amazing king. God called him a, a man after his own heart. He was very loved by God and um, a very real kind of person. And uh, in 1 Chronicles 21, it um, has an account where King David wanted to take a census of the people of Israel. And you wouldn't think that was such a bad thing, right? I mean, you wanted to count how many people you had that was uh, under your, in your kingdom. And what, I, what you realize is, you know, God is not a God who works in natural mathematics, okay? If you had 3,000 people, he'll reduce it to 300 people so he could wage a war, win a victory, and all glory goes to him, okay? He is not a God of the normal numbers, of the normal logic. What seems impossible with you, with doctors, with life, with circumstances, is possible with an impossible God. He is a God that works wonders, right? And altars is something really, really powerful, like Pastor Sam said. The, uh, you know, in our rebellion, in everything that we have done, whether it is our anger or whether it is an addiction, whether it is a generational bondage, whatever it is, there are evil covenants that have come in place and evil altars that have been erected in our lives, and we don't even know about it. This is why it's important to understand the old altars that we're going through, because ultimately it is a foreshadow of the ultimate altar that was built, the ultimate sacrifice that was made at an ultimate cost that no one can ever repay, right? So David takes a census, and in Chronicles, in the same, th in, in, in uh, 2 Samuel 24, 18 is the account of the story. In 1 Chronicles also, it accounts the same story. It says, Satan moved um, David to count his people. Because you see, as soon as he counted people, he wanted to enlarge in his empire by his might and his doing not by the strength of his God who had led him through every battle and brought every victory to him. It's almost like forgetting what God had done for him and saying, this one I can take care of because this is my people and my armies, my strength, my pride. If you see that that is what it is, then you will understand what came upon David afterwards. He was God was really, really angered by this. God was angered by this, and God spoke through a prophet called Gad and said, because of what you have done, you have greatly aroused my anger, and because of who I am, I am going to bring judgment upon you. You can choose one of three ways that you will suffer the affliction and the judgment of your actions. He said, either there will be seven years of pestilence, or of famine, there will be three months where your enemies will pursue after you, or there will be three days of plague. And when David heard this, and you know, we do things in our own strength, and we want to escape the judgment of God, and when God judges, we think, he's such a bad guy, he's so evil, he's in to get me. No, he is righteous, and he is good, and he is holy, and this is who he is. And so there is judgment. And so David looks and he sees his sin. So this altar that David built is an altar of first repentance because he realizes that he has sinned. The Bible says every single one of us have gone astray. Every one of us has missed the mark. Every one of us has wandered away from him. And today, if you don't know him, it is a day to come back because it is a good Friday. It is a good Friday. If there are altars that are erected in your life, it is a good Friday to understand that the ultimate altar paid every debt, that the ultimate altar paid the highest sacrifice, that you don't have to walk in bondage any longer. So David goes and he repents. And repents, repentance is not saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, repentance is when you really understand what it has cost God, what it has cost you to bring. So when God's judgment falls, 70,000 people die in a three-day um, plague, and David repents. He comes back. He turns away from his sin. He understands his rebellion. He understands his pride that has cost this whole nation 
and he comes and he wants to build God an altar. And he comes when the angel of death is just around and he is taking the lives of those. He, he stops at Jerusalem and he stops at, at, at the threshing floor of Aruna. The man who the threshing floor belongs to, his name is Aruna. And he sees David and he says, my Lord, the king, what do you want here? And he says, I need to offer a sacrifice to God. I have angered him. I have been prideful in my rebellion. And this is what it does, you know. When you get convicted of your sin, the first step you take is repentance. You know, there's this great... Um, revival that's happening in America. The first thing that started off was public repentance. And repentance is not just getting up on a stage and saying it, you're sorry. Repentance is actually understanding the cost of what your actions have made. The cost and what it actually cost and where it cost and the price that had to be paid because of our sin, right? And so Aruna says, king, you are my beloved king, so whatever I own is yours. You take the land, you take the oxen, you make the sacrifice, it's all yours. But David says, I don't want to take something from you and make a sacrifice. I want to pay you for the land because I must understand and appreciate the cost of it. What doesn't cost me, I cannot go and sacrifice. We can't bring something that doesn't cost us before our king. It must cost us something. It is then that we understand that laying it down means something. So ultimate repentance comes and ultimate cost is to sacrifice at the cost of something. And I want to tell you, there might be many altars erect in your life today, and you might not even know it. You might think it's just your anger, or it's just an addiction. It's just a little bit of this. And it's, but can I tell you, it has been something that has opened the door for the enemy, and now there is an altar erect. As long as there is an altar erect, there is a covenant between you and the evil one, and he has full right, full right, legal right to run full circle in your life. And not just you, your generation and your children and their children have been covenanted because of your actions or your inactions or what has come down the bloodline. But Jesus says he came to give us life and life abundantly. If we believe in our hearts and confess in our mouths, he who paid the ultimate price says, I will draw close to you. And I want to invite you today. And I want you to be, I want this to be the best Friday of your life when you understand what it means. He paid the ultimate price. You know, this morning, Varuni was listening to an interview on the voice of the martyrs. There was an Iranian girl. Um, she had tried to take her life five times. She had attempted to commit suicide five times because she was molested as a little girl by an associate of her father's. And she had tried so many different attempts, but she had had an encounter with Jesus. And she just couldn't stop telling people about Jesus. She still lives in Iran, and so they, did, they didn't disclose who her real identity was. And she said, you know, the, the greatest joy, the greatest peace of my life is knowing him. And I was able to forgive the person who did this great wrong to me. And I can walk into a room and people, you know, he, she says, Iran is full of hospital beds with young girls who have tried to cut themselves and uh, commit suicide. Young people who don't see the, the uh, nothing but emptiness in their lives. And he, she said, when I walk into a room, people say, what's so different about you? And all I can say is that Jesus lives on the inside and he is my everything. And then the interviewer says to her, do you realize that there is such a great risk you are taking? She said, Every morning when I kiss my husband, when I say goodbye to my husband, and when he says goodbye to me, we leave like we are leaving for our last day because I know the cost of my faith, but I know the cost of what he paid for me, and I will walk this faith. So it does cost you because Jesus says, if you want to follow me, bring your cross, carry your cross, and follow after me. There is a cost. There is a cost. There is a cost when you follow him, but there is no greater joy no greater peace, no greater thing in life than the knowledge of who he is in your life and the salvation that comes to you only from him, through him, in him, with him, to live the destiny that he has called you to live. And this day, may every altar be broken that the evil one has erected in your life because Jesus says on that day on Calvary he made a public spectacle of every work of the enemy he disarmed every work of the enemy on Calvary's altar the ultimate altar broke 
every altar that has ever been erected in your life. And it might be something that came down generations. It might be a blood curse. It might be a blood covenant. It might be an addiction. It might be bondage that you don't even know. You just think it's just, oh, I have a terrible temper. I have a terrible problem with this. I have a terrible... No, there is an entry. There is an altar. There is something that is a covenant in your life today, this day may it be the best Friday of your life when you realize the ultimate altar paid the ultimate price. And when you know that, may you be quickened to repentance, that you will come with a heart that is repentant. Lord, in my pride, in my rebellion, in my stubbornness, in my own seeking, I have forsaken the one who called me, the one who, ma who I mattered to the most, and I walked away from your great love. Lord, take me back. Take me back. I repent today. And repentance is not just a word from your mouth, but a heart attitude that completely turns from where you have been. So if you have walked in disobedience, if you have walked in rebellion, if you have walked in pride, if you have walked in anything that is away from him, I call you today. I invite you, come to the altar. Come to the altar. He came to save, and the very ones that he came to save were the ones who stripped him naked, the ones who placed the crown on his head, the ones who beat him. But he says, no man takes my life. I lay it freely. And he laid it freely so that you and I could come to the altar, that you and I could walk in perfect freedom, that you and I can have joy that no man can take, that you and I can have perfect peace no matter what is going on in our lives. This is the altar that we celebrate. And I pray that this Good Friday, that you will come, that you will come to his altar in repentance at a cost of leaving all things that you have known your comfort zones and everything you have sought comfort in, that you will leave that at that cost that you will come and come to the one who has called you by name. Amen. I'm going to sing another worship song. It's an old one, so if you know it, you can close your eyes. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love 
Hallelujah. What a great time to remember his death on that cross. Jesus cried when he saw Jerusalem. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Why did he cry? He knew that Jerusalem will be destroyed by the Romans. And when Jesus was carrying that cross, he saw the women crying and coming behind him. He said, daughters of Jerusalem, don't cry for me. Cry for your children and cry for yourself. He paid the price because he loved you and me. And in Revelation says, 12, 12, he says, Satan is right now in this world destroying people. And everything that is happening in the world, it is written in the Bible. My dear brothers and sisters, you must know the end time is near that Jesus is going to come soon. Repent for your sins and be ready. When he comes, he will call you by name. Your name, he will call you because Jesus loves you so much. This is the time for us to repent for your sins. Ask forgiveness from God. If you don't know what is sin, ask the Holy Spirit right now. And the Holy Spirit will convict you. Everything. Jesus is right now in our midst. I can feel His presence right now. Are you ready to accept Him as a personal Savior? Are you ready to give your life to Him? Because our life is in His hand. Nothing can doctors do. Nothing can man do. It's only God can heal you. Whatever sickness that you are having right now. Only through His blood that all bondages can be broken. Curses will be broken. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Surrender everything to the Lord. Confess your sins. My son, my daughter, Jesus always says, My son and my daughter, because he loved you so much. Are you ready to receive him? Open your heart and say, I want to receive you as my personal savior today. Jesus says, I love you, my son, my daughter. Do you love him? And today is a special day, as Chris said. A day of repentance. Call upon his name and say, Jesus, come into my heart. He will come into your heart. John 12, 12 says, Those who believe me, they are my children. And he's a father to you today, if you believe him. Jesus, before his death, he took bread and he gave thanks and he said, This is my body. Whenever you eat this, you remember my death. He took a cup and he gave thanks and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. Whenever you drink this, you remember my death. Let us search our hearts, ask forgiveness from God, and partake the bread and wine. Amen. Praise God. Please be seated. I'd like to invite Shri to share the next word.
the altar that um, I'm going to speak about is uh, the altar that um, Elijah built. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of you know the story of uh, Elijah and the prophets of, uh, of Baal. Don't uh, forget what you, what, what you know, because I think it's a, it's a good place to, to just, as Sonali said this, uh, just before, uh, to re-hear the story and to actually understand how that altar uh, got transformed into the altar that Jesus uh, was uh, on the cross of Calvary. So uh, King Ahab and uh, his wife Jezebel were pretty evil people. And uh, at that time, they actually uh, had to, um, like a, they were worshipping Baal, they were, which was uh, basically just evil gods that uh, uh, worshipped the enemy. And uh, the, what, what happened there is that uh, it was not just them, but they led the people of Israel to worship them as well. And, uh, and the problem there is that uh, you had a whole nation that was completely full of sin and uh, actually building altars for themselves and not uh, of, uh, of God. So God had Elijah that was there his prophet, and one of the prophets that, um, if, you, if you look at uh, the, the word of God, Elijah is pretty up there in terms of uh, prophet standing, you know, like uh, everyone knows Elijah, uh, and, uh, and we can see, we'll see why, because uh, what he has done is something that, uh, I mean, it's an amazing feat, and uh, uh, you see, when, when evil comes into the world the way it did, uh, God permits it, but at the same time, he also had uh, found a way to get his people back to him. Uh, and uh, he caused a drought for people to cry out to him to, so that uh, uh, they would be able to uh, see uh, the God that they, they worshipped uh, and actually come to their rescue. But what did the people do? <laughs> they didn't actually look at that. They, they were just busy with their own things. You know, like a, there is a, this thing of uh, numbers, you know, where it's good to be with the popular ones rather than the unpopular ones. And, and sometimes we fall into that uh, stage where we want to just uh, go with the flow and do whatever everyone else is doing. And, uh, and here you have Elijah who was standing against that stream. Uh, God called him and asked him to go and confront uh, those prophets. And you have this battle that happened uh, up there on Mount Carmel. The, uh, you had, uh, he was telling to those prophets, 450 prophets of Baal, mind you, uh, 400 of uh, uh, Ashart, and uh, he was just one. And all of those prophets built an altar to their gods and tried everything, cutting themselves, doing everything that they could uh, to actually get that, uh, um, that altar to, to catch fire and to actually uh, show that their God is actually coming down and nothing happened. Elijah's altar that uh, was built with water as well that was poured onto it three times. Uh, God came down when Elijah spoke and consumed everything. This is the power that our God has, you know, like uh, we look at everything that is there and there is no comparison between what our God does and everything else. It's it, there, everyone is just going back to like, a, you, you can't compare, you know, like sometimes, you, you know, you have this thing of uh, you, the angels and the evil ones on one side, you have uh, Jesus and Satan on the other side, but it doesn't even compare, you know, and, and sometimes we, we forget uh, that in, in, the, in those circumstances because you see Elijah, was there up there by himself, and he saw the power of God working for, for him there. And he had a question to the crowd, and the question was, uh, that was in uh, 1 Kings 18, 21. Just the verse 21? Thank you. It says, Elijah came uh, to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If it is the Lord, if, if the Lord is God, follow him. And this is what I want to ask you today. Like, you know, sometimes we can get caught into uh, 
a lot of things around the world, whatever we want, and, and things that are quite uh, difficult in our lives. But do we go to him first? Do we actually try to, uh, to know who our God is? And are we following him? Because sometimes we, like Chris was talking about, we, we, we keep building altars for everything that uh, is uh, around us because it's what suits us. It's in, on our own terms. We want to actually give our relationship uh, the best that we can in our own strength. We want to do the best work and climb the ladder because that's what we want. But uh, uh, where is God in the, in, in the midst of that? You know, like, where is he? Because, you, you know, like, uh, Sonali used the, the same scripture that I have as well, which is, you know, when, when Jesus was um, uh, at... Um, um, uh, sorry, thank you. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said something in uh, Matthew 26, 40, uh, 26, 39. He said, not, uh, sorry, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you, uh, as you will. Not as I will, but you will. You know, like, uh, sometimes we have this thing of... Uh, we, we want to have God, and as long as God is walking in the same direction that we are walking, we are good. But when God does not walk in the same direction that we want, we have a problem. And how do we reconcile this? You know, and this is going back to this, like, how long will you falter between those two opinions? Like, uh, how long will you take this thing of, I want to do things my way and not God's way? Like, uh, there is such a, uh, a thing here where we can see the power of the living God. Uh, in that, and you, it's, it's just like, a, you know, we talk about Good Friday because you see on the cross, you had the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Almighty God, with all power and everything there, and held by those nails. And we think that we were holding all the power. We think that we can just tell him what we want uh, him to do for us. You know, like, uh, come give me my healing. Come give me my comfort. Come give me all of those things. He will give it, but we need to love him first. You know, like, uh, if it is possible, like, uh, if it is what we, what we know the power of our God. We can see it in, in the life of Elijah. And do you know the irony of it? Can you put uh, Matthew 27, 50, uh, uh, 45 to 50. Now, from the sixth hour until the, uh, the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out aloud and saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those uh, who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. I immediately, one of those ran and took a sponge, filled it with our wine, and put, uh, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded he up his spirit. You see, the people at that time, they were thinking that Jesus was calling upon Elijah because they knew the power of Elijah and saw what he has done on Mount Carmel. But who was on the cross? The God that gave the power to Elijah. And we think that we know everything. We can be so deceived by the fact that uh, we want things our way. So I, I really want you to, to grasp this because uh, you know like uh, the wisdom that, that he has given us when standing where we are right now we can see how all of this has happened. Let's not be like those people looking at uh, uh, circumstances and everything that, in the way that we want in our own eyes, but look at it from God's way, in God's eyes. Because you see, should we, should we have had fresh eyes, those people, they would have seen that they were actually put to the cross, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. So I want to really finish with this. The power of God is so much bigger than what our idols can have. You know, uh, our idols can be anything that we put above uh, our God, above Jesus. 
And sometimes we may think it's just a little thing here uh, and a little thing there because it gives us comfort. It gives us, like, you know, like counsel. It gives us something that we want. But they are powerless, completely powerless, rendered to nothing compared to the power of the living God. So I really want you to, to, to grasp this again. You know, I, I want to leave you with, uh, with this because regardless of where the majority goes, regardless of where uh, we, we want to go into and follow the flow or do whatever we want to do, it will only work if God is with us. So again, I will ask you this. How long will you falter between two opinions? If it is the Lord, if the Lord, sorry, if the Lord God, if it is the Lord God, follow him. So, thank you. We're going to sing a worship song. Just want to ponder on those words. Can we identify with the Ishmaelites? Have we faltered between two loves, two desires? to opinions.
I want to um, set the scene of the final altar. Last week, we read about in Palm Sunday how they had thrown palms as Jesus rode and into, on a donkey and said, Alleluia. place that we are talking about is the same mountain that Abraham had taken Isaac to. Looks a little bit different today. Jesus had been arrested in Gethsemane. And after the arrest, we see that there is a series of trials that he's taken to. He goes between the Jewish courts and the Roman courts. Um, we learned last week that the Jews could no longer decree a death penalty. They needed the Romans to decree it. So they took him between the two, no one wanting to make a decision. Finally, when he comes to Pilate's court, Pilate says, what shall I do with the one who is called Jesus? Today, as you have heard the words shared of the different altars, this is perhaps the most important question you will answer in your life as you leave here today. What will you do with this one called Jesus the Christ? Mark records, after Pilate decrees, they take him to be flogged. They put a sack over his head. They punch him in the face. And they say, if you're a prophet, tell us who punched you. After they had done that, they whip the sack off and they take, pull out his beard. They pluck his beard. You don't fully understand the flogging that took place before we, for many, many years, we used to read and they flogged him and walked past that line so quickly until Mel Gibson produced the passion. Can we have the slide of the flogging? The, the Romans had really perfected the art of this. Um, they had something called the cat of nine tails. Every slip of leather, strip of leather had bones and glass and metal embedded into it so that when it was, it impacted your body, it would hook into your flesh, ripping it apart. Can we go to the next slide? By the time Jesus had been whipped, the next slide of Jesus on the cross, please. By the time Jesus had been whipped, he was so disfigured. Isaiah says, 700 years before, 700 years before, Isaiah says that he didn't even look human. He was a mass of shredded muscle with bone coming through. They then put a robe around him and they fashioned a crown made out, out of acacia wood. It's a matter of interest that it's the same wood that was used to build the Ark of the Covenant. They didn't place the crown on his head. They beat the crown onto his head so that the crown, the thorns would be embedded that would go into him. And then they forced him to carry his cross um, up the mount. In the beginning of the first century, when the Romans were in power, they didn't have mass weapons to control the crowds. The way they asserted their power is that if there was an insurgence, they would quench it with such um, brutality that you wouldn't even think of an uprising. So um, the, when Spartacus led a rebellion and he was defeated, Rome crucified 6,000 men down a road of 120 miles so that as people came in, they would see the 6,000 men crucified and not even have thoughts about a rebellion. The crucifixion was the most brutal form of punishment in the history of humanity. That's where we get the word excruciating from, from the cross. We see that the nails that were pierced in his hands and his feet, it says hand, hand in that time was anything between the tops of your fingers to down here, were quite large. And these are the nerve centers, 
so many nerves, so much sensation in your body. In most of the, the renditions of the story, you see Jesus wearing a loincloth, but the truth of it is they stripped him naked. For a Jewish man, that was horrific. Scripture tells us the women did not come close because they didn't want to see. They looked from afar. He wasn't hung from 10 foot high. He was hung from a few feet high so that people could see. They could mock. So he could hear the taunts. And then in the, most, in the, in the biggest understatement that you read in Scripture, it says, and they crucified him. And that's all it says. They crucified him. But when you go to Psalm 22, you see a scene-by-scene scene breakdown of what happened. You see, Jesus on the cross makes a number of statements. He makes seven statements. One of the statements he makes is the one that Shri read, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he made that statement, every Jewish kid that was around knew exactly what he was talking about because they had memorized the Old Testament, the Psalms, and the prophets, right? So they knew it. So the minute he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In their head, the Hebrew um, teachers call it remez. It's a hint. It's a hint that triggers something. It triggers Psalm 22, which King David wrote about a thousand um, years before the crucifixion. And in this, 300 years before crucifixion is even invented, David writes a detailed account of what a crucifixion will look like. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? And from the words of my groaning, my God, I cry out in the daytime, but you do not hear. I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, despised by people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out their lips. They shake their heads saying, he trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him. When you read the accounts of the crucifixion, you're going to see the familiarity of what you're hearing here. Many bulls of Bashan, they have encircled me. The Roman Empire, Emper, Emperor was known that, that one of the symbols that they used was bulls. Um, they gape at me with their mouths like a raging, roaring lion. I am poured out like water. When you read the crucifixion account, you see that a spear is put in his side, and then out of, out of the blood comes water. They pierced my hands and my feet. My garments were tossed, uh, shared, divided among them. My, for my clothing, they cast lots. We hear that as he's there and he says, I passed, they give him a sponge with bitter vinegar. Archaeologists say that there's only two possible reasons why they had a bucket and a sponge with bitter vinegar. Because the Roman soldiers, they carried certain things in their backpack, certain things that they carried um, for their hygiene purposes to clean themselves once they had gone to the toilet. Where they were was near uh, the public toilets because outside the city. So it is most likely that the reason there was a sponge and a stick and a bucket of vinegar that was used to disinfect was that was the, the, the toilet paper of their time. I want you to understand it was not um, mercy that they shoved the sponge with vinegar in our king's mouth. What does it take someone who made the tree that he hangs on, who gave the idea to shape a nail, what does it take to stay there on that cross as the very things you breathe life to and the very breath they draw that allows them to swing that nail and that hammer is because you permit it. What does it take to stay on that cross? 
You see, when we look at the altars of the Old Testament, we understand dimensions. We understand the obedience of the heart of Christ. We understand the great cost that that came at a price. We understand that the power that was found in the death of Christ, we see glimpses of it. But the challenge for us is this. In, in modern day, it, um, it assaults our sensibilities. It assaults our sensibilities. So instead of preaching Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ crucified, we go back to the Old Testament and we say, what you need is more fun in your life. Come to Jesus, he'll give you fun. What you need is more happiness. Come to Jesus, he will make you happy. What you need is power. Look at the power the cross offers. Come to Jesus, there is power more than what you can fathom. What you need And we go back to the shadows when we have seen the ultimate altar. And we have seen how all of them came together. Paul writing to the Galatians says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Christian, we live in a time when it is not considered to be smart to believe that Jesus Christ died for you. That we are going to, Jesus is going to come again. We're going to live forever and he is going to rule as king. It's considered to be someone who is not smart that thinks that. I mean, you can't if you're, you know, a, a cultured mind would not entertain such an archaic thought. And so we fill our minds with philosophy and we say, look how smart Jesus is. Look how smart Jesus is. Jesus confirmed all these things. Look how much we know. We know this much. We can meet you there and and lift it up by, you know, a little bit. 1 Corinthians 1.22. Paul battled something very similar. For since the wisdom of the world, sorry, for since in the wisdom of the world, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs, and the Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to the Gentiles. We don't need a new gospel. We don't need to go back to the Old Testament, to the partial altars, but that were only there so that we could see what the ultimate altar would bring. We don't need to upgrade our faith so that we sound more eloquent as we preach it. The truth that we hang our hats on as we go to sleep is that Jesus Christ came as a man, son of God, holy flesh, sinless, In that moment on that cross, his body is completely shedded. He is completely humiliated. But what does he cry out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because greater than all those things we see when we look at the crucifixion was the separation from the Father. That broke his heart. That broke his heart. But Jesus Christ came and clothed in on him that day was every sin you and I would ever commit. And so when he plunged the depths of hell, he was clothed in that. He was clothed in that and he took yours and my penalty so that when you and I come to Jesus and Satan comes to you and says, what about that? The offering was paid. What about that? Paid in full, no more blood. There is no more blood. And the blood that was shed never loses its power. Never loses its power. Christian, you and I, we don't need a new gospel. The challenge for us today is we are trying to keep up with a world that is telling us we are out of date. But let us be 
those like Paul that says it is foolishness to the world because the Jews are looking for signs and the Greeks are looking for wisdom and you want power and you want miracles and you want me to quote poetry and Plato. But here's the truth. There is life only, only in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Only. Because when Jesus cried that day in Gethsemane and he said, Father, if there is any other way, take this cup. If there was any other way, if as Oprah says, all roads lead to Rome, if there was any other way, Jesus was false that day. But there is no other way. It is not your way and my way and we'll find out when we get there. There is no other way. There is salvation only through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's a good Friday. That's why it's a good Friday. There is no other gospel that can be preached. There is nothing I can add to this that will make it more glorious if we can behold what he did and we can walk away unmoved. If we can behold what he did and say, yeah, that's great, but all I want from you, King Jesus, is to bless my finances. All I want from you, King Jesus, is to touch my job Find me a husband and make me rich and famous. We're not preaching the cross, church. We're not preaching the cross. Because he says, if anyone wants to come to me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. His invitation to you and I is come, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Deny yourself. What is it you want? What is your Isaac? You're not going to hold your Isaac with one arm and carry the cross with one arm. What is the Isaac that you need to lay down? What is your Isaac that's stopping you from picking up your cross? What is your Baal? See, the children of Israel, their problem was not that they didn't worship God. It's just that Baal was the God of the harvest. There was a drought. You've got to get wise about these things. Go to church on Sundays, but then go to the guy that can get you your income. Go to the guy that you think is going to meet your immediate needs because you can't go hungry. How long will we not trust that the one who saved is the one who provides? That the one who saves is still the one that provides? How long will we be between two things? A Sunday Christian and a Monday I do it my way. How long? See, the wisdom of God is foolishness to the world. But if we are not completely in Him, we're not seeing the power of this altar. Because you and I, we don't just, we're not just saved by this altar. We live in this altar. It is this ultimate altar that we come to day in, day out, where we lay our will, where we lay our obedience, where we take His righteousness, where we live the holy lives He calls us to live. God is not cheating you. He has not forgotten you. He wants to give you more than what you want for yourself. And right now, you and I, we just don't see things the way He sees it. So my prayer is this. That this Good Friday, don't let it be like any other Good Friday. Don't let today be a ritual. You came to church, you saw the cross, you shed some tears, you walk away to living life exactly the way you lived it before for yourself. Don't let it be. If we are people for the cross, Jesus Christ didn't die so that you and I could just have better lives in this tiny twinkling of an eye that we have here on earth. He died so you and I could live like him. He died so we could take up our crosses and live like Jesus. Live like Jesus. And that is what will not make sense to a world filled with so much knowledge. That is what will change the world. That is what will speak light. That is what will bring hope. And that is my invitation to you this Good Friday. As we come to the altar, the ultimate altar, and we remember the sacrifice that was made for you and I, it is not so we can come 
receive and walk away like the Israelites did. It is so that we can live in the glory of the cross as people of the cross. Because what he died to give you is more than anything you can fathom, anything you can imagine today, anything that you are hoping that he will give you is but a shadow. It's but a shadow of what the king came to give you. As we sing our final song and we prepare to close today's service, let's go into a time of worship. If, you can, if any of the words spoken this afternoon have resonated in your heart, I want to invite you this afternoon. Don't walk away today. It is for freedom. It is for freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Every altar in your heart that you believe this is the thing that will give you joy. It can't. It can't. And that's why the God of the, the harvest could not bring a harvest when the God of all creation calls a drought. Let's come back. Today when we celebrate his life, death and resurrection, let's come back. We are not just saved by this cross, we live in the power of this cross. We rejoice in the glory of this cross. For I am dead to all things in this world and all that I am is bound in this cross. And maybe that's not you today. And it seems like such a lofty prayer. Won't you come back to him and just say, Lord, I made it something so little. I made it a Sunday thing. I made it a fun thing. I made it a Jesus thing. I made it so many things that were so much less than what you died to give me. But today I want to come back. I want to come back. I want to come back. I want to see the power of your presence in me. I want to see how when I stand with you, everything around me shifts. Because in this altar, there is providence. In this altar, there is the supernatural. In this altar, there is love so amazing, so divine.
made right before a holy God because of your son, Jesus. That our past has been removed, our sin forgiven, made completely whole. Every other altar bring brought low because of the power of your name and the power of your blood. For what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that does not change because the blood never loses its power. The blood never loses its power. And this afternoon as we close, I want to invite you. Maybe things got a bit lukewarm somewhere. I want you to invite you to take him up at his word. Come back to the cross. To live for Jesus. To live for Jesus. To live for Jesus. That we will die in him. And because we have died in him, that our life is found in him. So Father God, I pray your blessing over your children this morning, afternoon. I thank you, Lord, that you came to bring complete freedom, complete restoration, complete newness in your son's name. And we thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you. We love you. Father, I pray your blessing over your children. I pray, O oh Lord, that in their heart is a joy and a hope that can't be shaken by the things around them because it's not the things around them that dictate how you love them. It's what you've done for them. And you stayed on that cross. You stayed on that cross for me and them. So, Father, I pray that lukewarm hearts are set alight again that there's a fire burning again, that there's revival in our midst again, for we are people of the cross. We're people of the cross. Father, I just pray your blessing, your peace, and your joy as we take this good news. For those of them who had seen the death and resurrection, they couldn't stop talking because it was a good Friday. Father, I pray that we will not be able to contain this. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless you.